Here is where the Holy Spirit through Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, reaches back over into the Old Testament. Following the very thing he wrote in Romans 15, 4, concerning the value of the Old Testament to those of us who are under authority to Christ in the New Testament. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Paul, of course, is interested in the church at Corinth and being faithful. And you've read through the letter and you know they had many mistakes in that church. And this letter was designed to correct those. So this is a letter not only of edification to build them up, to make them faithful as Christians, but of course it rebukes them for sins they were in and calls them to repentance. Notice what he says about himself in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest I by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In other words, he is put himself in the same boat as every other Christian. You must put your all into it. You must be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You must personally have your faith in Christ built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition, Romans 10, 17. To walk by faith and not by sight, you have to do that, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And so he moves on with no chapters or verses in this letter originally. And he says, moreover, connected to what I've just said, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. I want to enlighten you here. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now he's talking about, of course, Moses, a type of Christ, leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And he says they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Let me pause here and say, if you wonder what the water coming out of the rock to give the children of Israel in their wilderness wandering thirst to quench their thirst, what it meant, well, you're learning right here. That water coming out of the rock at the behest of Moses was a type of Christ. And Christ kept that same idea when he talked about him having the water of life when he was at the, with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Same idea. But with many of them, those who left Egypt, Israelites, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Whose examples? Christians' examples. To the intent, well what do they teach us? To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then he goes into the matter of neither be ye idolaters or some of them. That is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And then watch what he says in verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. Notice in the King James it's E-N, not E-X. E-N in the King James means it's a pattern aimed at at spiritual Israel, the church. And they are written for our admonition, the church's admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now I want you to hold that because again I say Paul is using the Old Testament the way it ought to be used by Christians today that we might walk closer to the Lord. These are words of edification as well as rebuke. Now, having said that, I want us to go back over to the Old Testament and keeping those points in mind and what Paul said in Romans 15, 4. And I want us to go to the book of Joshua. This is after they have arrived in the land of Canaan. They've been there a while. And Joshua is nearing the end of his days. 
But I would like for us to keep in mind this could be applied to us today. Because there's one thing stands out among many, but one thing stands out in what we just read in 1 Corinthians 10. It is obvious that from this, just because a person has been saved from past sin, slavery to sin, doesn't mean there's nothing to be concerned about from here on out. Because it's obvious after they were baptized into Moses, a type of Christ, in the cloud and in the sea, water on both sides, water vapor making up the cloud, they were baptized, submerged, they passed through, Moses, a type of Christ leading them, well, they were freed from Egyptian bondage, a type of alien sins that all men must be forgiven of to become Christians today. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. But that wasn't all there was to it, was it? With many of those people, God was not well pleased. What people? The Israelites who passed through the baptism to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were freed from bondage to sin in the sense of bondage to Pharaoh, a type of being in bondage to sin and in need of salvation. But God was not well pleased with many of them after they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All you have to do is go back to the Old Testament and read all about it and why they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. But when you come down to the time of Joshua here, this is after they've been in the land of Canaan for some time. And we're able to see that Joshua is still concerned. Joshua 23, verses 1 through 13. And the scripture is letting us know that Joshua is now old and well stricken in years. Joshua 23, 1. Now, I think that's important to realize because he's still as concerned as ever about serving God. And more so, he's even concerned about what will become of these people. Because Joshua went through all of that in the wilderness. He and Caleb are the only two of 20 years old and upward that came out of Egypt, baptizing the Moses in the cloud and in the sea, who made it in to the promised land. Not even Moses did that. So he's seen all of this. He knows these people. He knows what they have to do. And now he knows there's not much longer that he's got to be with them. But this teaches us again that just because you have received the possession of the promised land in the case of fleshly Israel, that didn't guarantee they could keep it. That didn't mean they could go off and live any way they wanted to and ignore God and rebel against Him. That didn't work. The whole of the Old Testament stands up as testimony to that fact. So I want us to consider what is said here that edifies them and is designed to rebuke them in this passage of Scripture. How does that apply to us today? Remember these things are written aforetime for our learning. They benefit us in living faithful to the Lord in His church under the authority of Christ set out in the words of the New Testament. Well, first of all, our salvation today must be secured by past deliverance. I can't be a Christian if I haven't been delivered from my alien sins, the sins that originally separated me from God. Sin is my worst enemy. Jesus solved the sin problem. And thus, through a faithful obedience to His gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, we can be relieved of all past sins and be added to the church by the Lord Himself, Acts 2.47. That is, to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, 38. The Lord adds us to His church. But it doesn't stop there, does it? We must understand that sin is a very cruel taskmaster for everybody. It's the only thing that can separate us from a loving God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. It it holds us in a vice-like bondage, Romans 6, 6 and Galatians 5, 1. And we all quote all the time, or I do, that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So we understand that all people accountable to God for their actions must be delivered from sin's grip. Or heaven will not be their home. 
And it was by the grace of God that he commendeth his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. And we know from further study of the scriptures that redemption being purchased back is possible to all, everybody, through the blood of Jesus Christ shed for the remission of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. But first, one must obey that gospel. Paul talks about that to Christians in Romans 6, 3 and 4 and 17 and 18. God be thanked that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. What was the form of teaching, the pattern of teaching? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. You were buried with Christ in baptism. So the one desiring to be set free from the bondage of sin will act upon his belief in God's word. Having acted upon that belief, he'll keep the command to repent of sins, Luke 13, 3. And confess his faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And being immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. As I've just mentioned, Romans 6, 4. That person then is a new creature in Christ where all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located, Ephesians 1, 3. Well, go back then to fleshly Israel. They were in a covenant relationship with God, having been delivered by Moses, a type of Christ, out of bondage in Egypt, a type of alien sins, as they went through the cloud in the sea, being baptized in Moses in the cloud in the sea. But once they got out in their wanderings, remember the first thing very shortly, as far as comparing that with the 40 years they wandered, they spied out the land and they could have gone in, but only Joshua and Caleb said we can rise up and take it immediately. The other people looked at their own strength, left God out, said, no, we can't do it. Well, God uh, simply said, well, all of you are going to die here in the wilderness. And they did. Twenty years old and upward, everybody left Egypt, baptized into Moses and clouded in the sea. They died there. Save Joshua and Caleb. So you can see why Joshua at this stage, they've been in the land of promise for a long time, is deeply concerned that they would be able to remain in the land. Now if you read Deuteronomy, which is a restatement of the law of Moses by Moses to them just before he died and before Joshua led them across the Jordan, Moses just holds their feet against the fire, so to speak, and says, here's what's going to happen to you if you do not obey God. Well, they should have known that, shouldn't they? As to why they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. It's because they didn't obey God. But we find then they needed to be told that. And Moses had them, had them understand that you must keep on doing what God commands you to do. And they promise, oh, we'll do that. And Moses turns around, if you read Deuteronomy, and says, but you won't. You'll go ahead and disobey him. Well, now, Joshua's there hearing all of that. He understood it as well as anybody on this earth. Now, those who are baptized in the Christ should realize that the old way of life, the old way of thinking, the old worldly man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed or done away that he might no longer be in bondage to sin, Romans 6 and 6. So one cannot go to heaven who refuses to be set free from bondage to sin. But just because one is set free from his alien sins doesn't mean heaven's going to be their home. Heaven will not be their home if they are not baptized, but that is not the end of it. It's the only it's only the beginning of the journey. You're a babe in Christ when you rise from water to the grave of baptism. You're just starting out. You must keep on keeping on, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So Israel's possession must be a possession that they keep. That is, the Israelites keep. They've possessed it now. They're there. 
But what is Joshua concerned about? But first, God told his people that there must not be any going back to the land of Egypt. It's always amazing to me how people can be in dire straits and undergo all sorts of privation and hurt. But then they get free of that, and then the tough things come upon them because of the choices they make and having to walk the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. And they forget all of that that was behind and they start yearning for the flesh pots and the food that they left behind. They forget all of the bondage they were under as slaves in Egypt. Joshua knew these people. Listen to what he said now. Verses 12 and 13. Else if you do at all go back, and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive these nations from out of your sight, but they shall be a snare and a trap unto you and a scourge in your sides. And thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. You see, they hadn't fully driven all these people out of the land yet. Joshua is saying you must continue to possess all the land God's given you and drive all these people out. Well, guess what? They didn't do it. And there's the beginning of their problems. It didn't just begin when they began to adopt idolatrous worship. But it's when they didn't keep the command of God to drive all those Canaanites out of the land. Joshua knew that. And even though he's been with them all this time and leading them in war the whole time he's been in the land of promise, they still hadn't done it. Well, children of God today must not return to the principles that govern those who live by worldly standards. Maybe it's easy to do so, and I think I've seen people. In fact, I know I have, who have obeyed the gospel, at least all outward appearances, and yet in time they went back to the world. Now, really, we're taught in Luke 8 that we might as well expect that as we go out to sow the seed of the kingdom of the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. If you look there, there's four types of ground. Three are types of ground that don't bear any good thing, ultimately and finally, spiritually. The other is called the honest and good heart that receives the word with all readiness and keeps it, brings forth fruit. So when I go out to teach, and I've let this be with me all my life, I need to realize as you sow that seed, as you teach that seed, different people are going to hear it. But only one kind are going to stay with it, obey it, and live righteous lives. Those who have good and honest hearts and continue to cultivate those good and honest hearts and they're willing to take with us, saith the Lord, for everything we believe in practice and solve all the problems that come our way that Satan throws out before us. But a lot of people give up. Now, if you study military history, it gets rather interesting to see who makes a good general and who does it? And some generals, and it's happened this way in virtually every war ever been fought by anybody. There are some generals who think they're doing a great job because they are dodging having to battle the enemy. They think they're winning the war when they can just keep their army from losing anybody, so they move around here and there and let the enemy try to follow them. But they're not. No army can win any battle by running from the enemy or dodging out. I don't just mean in retreat, but just never fighting a battle. You can't do it. It won't work. You give ground to the enemy without even giving battle to the enemy. You say, what does that have to do with living the Christian life? Well, as far as I know, each individual Christian is a soldier in the army of the Lord. 
Paul even talks about he had fought a good fight. He had kept the faith. He used to sing the fight his own old Christian soldier. I guess that's politically incorrect nowadays to sing that the fight is on, old Christian soldier. Or soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on. But there's still the armor listed in the word of God that Christians are to put on if they're to be faithful. So we cannot go back to living according to the worldly standards. The old man of this world and his worldly ways should have died at the point of repentance and been buried when we were buried with Christ in baptism. 2 Corinthians 5.17 then there's the warning of the Hebrews writer. And it's about as clear as anything could be. Take heed, brethren, lest happily there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief and falling away from the living God. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Now that gets interesting because we normally focus in on the idea of you can fall so as to be eternally lost once you have obtained being a Christian. But notice what else he says in that verse. He says, Lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. That means I can recognize if I'm going into a state of unbelief. Now that doesn't just mean in your mind you're rejecting the truth of God and not believing it. It means, as James talked about it in James 2, you can say the Word of God teaches thus and so, and you're right. But if you don't obey it, what kind of faith did James say that is? It's a dead faith over against a living, obedient faith. I can know whether I'm on God's side or not because I can know whether I have a dead faith or living faith. If you go to James 2, James writes to brethren, and he is really scolding them severely for having a dead faith. Acknowledging the truth of God and what ought to be done is important, far more important than to carry it out in your life. So he gets on their case pretty well, and so he gets on all our cases for the same reason that Joshua was doing so here. One cannot fall from where he's not been. And it's the responsibility of the Christian to not go back and, I guess, his sheep graze on worldly pastures. And I can know what I'm just with word of mouth saying. That's what the Bible teaches. And I can know then when that's all I'm saying. But I'm not submitting myself to it. Remember what we started out with from Paul? That he buffeted his body and brought it in subjection? How much did Paul desire to be obedient to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? He worked all the time to keep his own life in subjection to the very things he taught others to do to be saved and to be faithful. It's easy to say, here's what you must do. It's quite another thing to say, I will consistently, day by day, do what I preach to others that must be. Second, Israel was to have no fellowship with the enemy. Again, Joshua's warning is quite plain, quite clear and to the point. He said, and I'll put some of these together in Joshua 23, first of all, verses 6 and 7, and then 12 and 13. He says, turn not aside. You have to do the turning, or you don't turn, one or the other. That's up to you. Turn not aside to the right hand or to the left. Notice what he then says. Come not among these nations, these that remain among you. Neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them. Neither serve them, nor bow down yourselves unto them. What was going to be the problem in the years to come? They did the very opposite. Then he went ahead to say, else if you do at all go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, they make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive these nations from out of your sight. But they shall be a snare and a trap unto you 
and a scourge in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. The Lord gave that to them because they continued steadfastly in the truth of God for their day and time. And when they would choose not to do that, he would take it away from them. Now, if you're at all familiar with just the basic teaching of the Old Testament regarding the children of Israel, they went right against what they told Moses they would do, as Moses said you would do. And then they ignored what Joshua said. Moses and Joshua knew these people. They were a fickle people. They would not stick with the truth through thick and thin and hardship and good times. Now, spiritual Israel is the Lord's church. And we're expected to learn in a lot of ways from fleshly Israel. How could we have such apostasy going on today in the church that's been going on for many years on fundamental matters that pertain to New Testament, primitive, pure New Testament Christianity? Somebody had to look at all these other religious groups and yearn to be like them. I remember many years ago when liberalism, loosing where God and His Word is not bound in various areas, began to make its uh, appearance 40, 50 years ago, that people who had obeyed the gospel, as old as my parents and grandparents, began to really be upset because they said, we left all of this denominationalism to come out of it and come to the Lord's church, and now it's being brought in. Not any different than what Joshua said is going to happen to you people that are fleshly Israel. You're going to begin to imbibe in all these things round about you. They needed to realize that going back to Abraham, they had been called out all of that. And especially when they formed a new nation down in Egypt. And then they followed Moses out of Egypt. But then look what all happened. They were always a fickle people in general. So the message is clear. When the Israelites, fleshly Israel, mingled with the Canaanites, ungodly people, watch it, it never improved the Canaanites, but it always brought misery to God's people. It's still so today regarding spiritual Israel. Back when I was a younger preacher, I was hearing people say, well, we can go learn things from these denominations. I thought, how does spiritual Israel under the authority of Christ, who understand what the plan of salvation is, they've obeyed it, they've debated it, they've fought it out in denominations, they've opposed the denominations, what are we going to learn from them? Tell me what are we going to learn from them. Are we going to learn how to be saved? Are we going to learn how to better worship God? Are we going to learn how to better live the Christian life day by day and how to make a home better? Well, that's not to say, of course, that denominations don't have some truth among them. I don't know of a denomination you can go to and find that they're just totally wrong on everything they believe in practice. But brethren, we don't want an intermingling of some truth and some error. That attitude... Is not taught in the scriptures. And if you don't see it anywhere else, what is Joshua saying to these people? He's saying you don't intermingle with these folks in the sense of listening to them and being in such a relationship with them that you begin to be influenced by them. Ungodly people cannot help godly people be better or to be more faithful or to worship God better. You can't do it. If that was the case, what do we need with the gospel and the pure truth of the New Testament and the Lord's church? Why don't we just intermingle with them? You're okay. I'm okay. That doesn't work. The ideal that a Christian must run with the world in order to reach worldly people for the cause of Christ comes from one place. The devil. In recent years, if liberalism is built upon liberalism, you've had people saying, well, we go and sit down and drink a beer with folks from the bar and have a Bible study. 
I don't know how much Satan may smile if there is such a thing on that supernatural wicked being. But he, if he ever does, he must really smile when he has Christians going into a bar with their beer, studying the Bible with somebody. When I used to have radio program, I would end that program by saying, we're ready to study with you anywhere, anytime that is a place conducive to good Bible study. And that's important. Sometimes I don't think we understand that. So one is not going to win over the person who's drinking with you some alcoholic beverage or why you have fellowship with drunks. And one's not going to convert those entangled in the various kinds of immorality and the sins of the flesh by attending their parties. Well, Jesus went to eat with sinners. He never participated in what they did. He never fellowshiped them in what they did. He went there to show his concern for them and to lead them out of it. Now, if you want to go to a bar and go in there and do like John the Baptist and stand up and declare very plainly, repent and start throwing bottles here and there and saying, give up this stuff. You're going to lose your soul. Well, you're welcome to do that. But I don't still think that is a good place conducive to Bible study. But sometimes it's amazing to me how easily we're beguiled. And then we wonder, how is it that Mother Eve, knowing the truth of God on the forbidden fruit, could easily change? We shouldn't criticize her when we have brethren do basically the same type of thing in believing a lie and obeying it. To please God and to reach the lost or the erring with God's truths, there's one guideline that set out that we forget. One must always come ye out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. 2 Corinthians six seventeen, And I will receive you. You don't go participate in sin or show fellowship to sin and expect to win them over to Christ. So we don't want to fail, but if we follow that line of thinking, it's the devil's counsel and we will fail. Remember, what we said a moment ago. When the Israelites mixed themselves up with the Canaanites, their paganism and idolatrous immoral actions, never, and I challenge you to go read and see, never did they improve the Canaanites. They always ended up being influenced for sin by the Canaanites. So a Christian must continue to walk in the light. We've been studying that on John as he's in the light, 1 John 1, 7. That is the way that you keep yourself in the love of God. And to the people who keep themselves in the love of God, who are faithful to him and obeying the truth pertaining to Christian living, that leads to heaven. And there's no other way you get there. If there's a time to rebuke people for their alcoholic drinks and their bad language and their dirty jokes and their whatever else they have, then it's individually. Be bold and pick out ways that you can do it. Call it to their attention. There are some people today who are raised in that kind of thing. They don't even realize there's, you may think they do, but many of them don't realize that they're even using that foul language. It's just part of what they are. I can't come up right now with all the different things you personally might think of in a situation to where you can call personal attention to somebody's life to what they say or do. But surely, if you really want to, you can figure out a way to do that. That's one way we're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, with the leavening for good in the world. We're putting into practice the truth. I just don't see the Apostle Paul mingling as he went out to preach the gospel with people who were wicked and just standing there like some dumb bunny and saying nothing about the way they lived. 
Do you remember when Paul walked on Mars Hill? It says his spirit was stirred within him. Because he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And he began to look for a way to be able to preach to them. And lo and behold, here's an altar to the unknown God. And that's where he put his foot down and says, This unknown God, I'm going to declare him to you. Now, is that an example for us, or is that just wasted words of God just telling about something that happened in history? I don't think so. I think it says every one of us should be looking for opportunities for us to say something to somebody, whether it's a family member, whether it's a work partner or school or wherever it is, to call their attention to what they're saying. Because I assure you, a great many of them have grown up in families, been around folks all along, and they've used that kind of language. They've told those kind of jokes. They think nothing of it. Well, it's leavening for good. We have to do something about it. And we have to capture their attention. Well, I close the lesson this afternoon by noting that we have to start on the trek to heaven, and that's being baptized into Christ as penitent believers for the remission of sin. But it by no means starts there, stops there. We must live the Christian life in the way that we see it taught in the Scriptures. The way Paul used the Old Testament to teach it, 1 Corinthians 10, the way Joshua did in Joshua 23. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do that this evening. As a child of God, if you have sin, there's a second law of pardon. That's repentance on your part of whatever the sin or sins would be. And confessing those sins and praying God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to do that now while we stand and while we sing.